villains, gangsters, or faces as they prefer to be called, are the men that have been making newspaper headlines for all the wrong reasons over the past 50 years. Some are instantly recognisable, but many are not. And if I stick a gun in your face, you're going to open up the door. I've got no worry, but even if the glass is bulletproof, and you know it's bulletproof, you're still going to open up that, because you're not going to trust your life against a bit of glass. Men like Eddie Richardson, Paul Ferris, Frankie Fraser, and Walter Norville, who have inspired fear and respect in equal measure for decades. People did fear me, yeah, because I was dangerous. In this new series, some of Britain's most infamous and influential characters have agreed to go on camera and tell it how it was and is. All of a sudden I went, <coughs> I went you move, I'll blow your fucking head off. Obviously, like, I didn't know that, but big gun in me head like that. I went, ah. So I took a dive when the shot went off, obviously, to get me in the motor. And after I got the main new motor, I waited two seconds and I took a dive on the front door and I slammed the front door behind us and got behind the brick walk. And that's when the uh, bullets saw kind of coming through the front door. I've had uh, aggravated burglary, torture, um, people being kidnapped and broken legs, broken arms, um, blackmail, racketeering, extortion. I've been done for everything you can think of. I'm not an electrician or a plumber or a dentist or anything like that. I'm a crook and uh, I get back into serious crime and it paid dividends for the next five years. My name is Bernard O'Mahony. I was a friend of the Cray Twins and a member of the infamous Essex Boys firm. I know this world, I know the faces, and I'm going to give you a no-holds-barred history of the British criminal underworld. The Brinks Mat Job, the Security Express Depot, and the Bank of America robbery. They are names etched in criminal history. But who are the men who carry out these type of spectacular heists? How do they do them and what makes them tick? In this episode, I meet a few of them to hear the inside stories on some of the most notorious jobs of the past few decades. One of the most violent and notorious armed robberies ever carried out in Britain took place at a nightclub in Ilford, Essex back in 1988. It was carried out by a man who was feared and respected in equal measure. His name is Vic Dark. It's hard to explain. It's uh, it's like it's excitement, and I really, I'm, I'm, you're a general junkie. You sort of like you, you live on the excitement of it all. You, be, you believe in your own, like carrying a 38 underneath your arm. You, you believe in your own gangster sort of like sort of untouchable. You're in a shell and you think you're untouchable. You know, you really do think you're untouchable. After a string of armed robberies across Essex and the South East, Dark and an accomplice set out to rob the Penthouse nightclub in Ilford in September 1988. It was supposed to be an easy job. Go in, grab the cash from the night's takings and leave quickly. What happened has gone down in the pages of criminal history. So what happened that night in Ilford? I brought out my head, said there's, a, there's a, about 25,000 or 30,000, which was quite a lot of money at the time. They said, all you've got to do is walk in and uh, wrap a couple of people up. We've got people in there, let you in the back door. I said, no problem. So um, I went up there, all rucksacked up. Because at the, at the, as you go up in the lift, you'd be met by doorman. And obviously, I went up with a rucksack on my back, with uh, my clothes in. I was put in a room, and uh, the fella said he was going to let me out with three, three uh, knocks. And obviously, he let me out. It was about it was a Caribbean do. And he let me out. It was about 120, probably I think it's 140 people was in the club when I come out, which was supposed to be three people. And right. it just turned into mayhem. I was, I was obviously, I was chinning people left, right, centre. As I was laying them all down. They thought it was a joke. You know, obviously I've got a big balaclava on, and I'm saying this big tall black kid, I'm going, get on the floor. And he's looking at me like that. I went, get on the floor. And obviously I went bang. He, and all of a sudden in statements, he says, I see Omar suddenly hit the floor. You know, and then obviously they realised it was real. 
You know, and I started to obviously, well done martial arts, I kick, run and kick some geezer in the chest and he flew back and, and then, um, and I just said to my mate, just rip the phones out. And as I, as I walked out, the first thing I see is a bow tie, so I hit him with an elbow, he went straight down. And then um, walked onto the dance floor, and then obviously the, the geezer with me decides to shout my first name out. Well, I thought he was ripping, ripping out the, the funds. Obviously, as I went like that, the geezer grabbed the, grabbed, grabbed the gun. And, uh, who, who grabbed the gun then? The, the nightclub owner. Oh, uh, the manager? Yeah, so it was, um, no, so uh, I can't really say it was me or it was him, but he, he got shot. So, uh, no, where, where was he shot? Apparently he went through his thumb. One for his arm, one in his stomach. So, but it wasn't intentionally. It wasn't like it was weren't done like blatantly to, to, to hurt him. Just in the struggle. In the struggle, what happened? Yeah. Dark's accomplice was also shot in the melee, and hearing the sirens of the first police vehicles arriving, he decided it was time for them to leave, and so he carried his partner down the stairs to the street. As I walked out, I was carrying him, and uh, I had him across my shoulder. So as I'm walking, I think, oh, we got away with this. And all of a sudden, obviously, police cars, they go, that's some over there. So I was just, I picked the gun up and they all sort of all backed off. And I went and the uh, cars were safe from me, uh, to say, back there. And I just said to them all back, or shouting out, go back. So all the police cars reversed back. And then uh, as they were reversing back, I went round the corner to get into the car. And then, uh, obviously, a police car pulled up in front of me and that's, I went to take the police car, policeman out of the car, and um, as I went, I looked up and all the police cars were there, so I thought, I've got no option, so I put him back in the police car, put my mate in the police car, and that was off. So I went through Ilford about 100 miles an hour, Simon's going, so I just said to the copper, I'll put a gun in his neck, said, look. Is the policeman driving you? Yeah, yeah, best rally driver I've ever had. <laughs> No, he's no joke. No, no, <laughs> no, but he was a fucking good driver too. He, uh, he was. Oh, serious. I ain't joking. He, I mean, he, he was fucking motoring through seven. He was going through red traffic lights. Went up around the bouts. Obviously, I, I'm surprised that he was like. So, anyways, so. What was you saying to the policeman? I just put a gun in his neck. And I said to him, tell him to back off. So. Uh, obviously, I could see all the signs. It was going. It was going 100 miles an hour, and all of a sudden, there's a big bang. And it just missed his head and blew the window out. But the gun went off? Yeah, it went off and blew the wind. Not intentionally, blew the window out. So he really thinks that I've done it for purpose. So obviously now he's turned into a super, he's like Lewis Hamilton. Eventually they were able to get some distance between themselves and the police chasing them. And they pulled up in a residential street to change getaway cars. I went to the front door and this Irishman comes to the to the to the uh, to the door. He just banged, went to random house and banged the door. Yeah, so I put the gun in the back of the policeman's back. I said, tell him you want his car. So the policeman was saying to the Irishman, I want your car. And being a typical Irishman, he's going, What are you talking about? What what do you want my car for? And I went, just give him the fucking car. Anyway, so he went and got his keys, come back out. So as he's, he's looked, the, and the copper, instead of going sort of taking the keys, I had two guns. So he went to give me the keys. Well, he, I can't take two, uh, well, two handguns, two 38s, I was like that. Sort of like that, the two 38s. And he's looked at me, the Irishman, and I've looked at him, and he, I realised he's only got his underpants on, which was quite funny, right? So I said, you're coming and all, mate. So, so, the, uh, so the Irishman said, uh, who, me? I went, yeah, you, come here. I grabbed him, he had a vest on, and his underpants, poor bastard. So I've got a policeman, an Irishman, a shop man and myself. Then we're off again. So uh, all of a sudden, he's going left, right. And I didn't know where I was. So the person with me is going, Vic, a Vic, I've been shot. I told him to shut up. So then he's going like that with his fingers. So we're doing about 80 miles an hour and we decide we hit a wall. So, we just, so the car was like smashed up like that. So. He's jumped out of the policeman. I looked at him and went, go oh, fuck off, because I don't need him no more. I see a couple of police cars in front of me, sort of all come up, load of police cars. So I looked round like that, and I looked, I thought, oh, fuck it, I'll take another police car. You can see in the depositions, I ain't bullshitting, so I started running like that. And I, was, I could see all the coppers' faces looking in the police cars. They was all looking at me like that. And they, must, and they was going, this geezer's running at me with two handguns. And obviously, I was like that, and I went, 
shot at them, and they fucking went, whoosh, just, they started going everywhere then. So I couldn't catch the police cars. So I turned round, went back, and there's a, I shouldn't make a joke of it, it was a Chinaman. And it was like what you call Chinese takeaway, so. <laughs> So anyway, so I walked up, put the gun to the child and said, I said, get in. And, he, and uh, there's a bird, right? His bird's going, I want to come. I went, fuck off, you ain't getting in the car. So I get some of him, he throws him in the car. It's like, it was like, say, I have a, he's fucking mad. So the bird's, I've got my foot and I'm pushing this fucking bird out, trying to get in the car. She's trying to get in the car. I've took her old man hostage and she's trying to get in the car with me. So I'll get, I'll get my foot and pushing her out of the fucking car because I don't want to take her hostage. Anyway, so the geezer with her chucks him in the back. He gets to the safe house. So I froze him. So what I've done, I, throw the, I remember throwing the door open like that, because obviously all the cars were behind us. I didn't want to know where, where he got out. So also I stopped. He ran out, ran into an house, which was a safe house. And I just kept on going. And then after that, I kept throwing the door open, kept throwing the door open, kept throwing the door open. And then I realised it was like a big snake. Like it was about, I must have picked up about 10, 15 police cars maybe more, and I knew it's a matter of time before I'm going to walk into a roadblock and obviously they're going to try and iron me out, so I ain't stupid. And um, so I thought, so what, what, what would I do next? Dark eventually took refuge in an open field where he hoped he could lie undetected until things quietened down. But freezing cold and wet with hypothermia setting in, he was unable to remain hidden any longer, and so he made a run for it across the field and was arrested. And there the events of the day should have ended, but they didn't. I'll get Nick, take me back to the police station, so I thought, fuck it, I'm gonna get out of this, I ain't gonna stay here. So they moved me quick in a van. So I get charged, get put in, go to court, put in a, in a prison van, like a protective van, and it had a big net on it. And, and, and at the time, it was a racket cover, and I thought, how the fuck can I get this off? And I just went like that. I thought I'd done it. At the time, I was a lot stronger than I was now. And I went like that, and it went ting. I couldn't believe it, it just went fell through. But now I've got the metal side of the van. I've got two years for this, two years concurrent. I was sitting there like that, and I've waited, and the three cop was in the front, and I, I didn't realise they had police cars behind me. And I jumped up, ripped the side of the van off. I've got the paperwork there, you can see it, night line. So I ripped the side of the van off. And they couldn't believe it. The cop was sort of looked round like that, and I fucking ripped the side of the van off. I don't know who done it. I just ripped the side of the van off, and uh, and where I'd done martial arts, it was about a window like that. I kicked that out. That went out. So I thought, fuck it. So, but the only problem was it was small. I'll try to get through like that. So I got halfway out, and his cop has run up, jumped out. So I grabbed him with one arm round the neck, and he's screaming. And the other one, I grabbed him by the uniform, and as they were straight around, they started pulling me out of the van. All of a sudden, I went. <laughs> I went, you move, I'll blow your fucking head off. Obviously, like, I didn't know, they put big gun in my head like that. I went, ah! So the dirty bastards fed me back through the van, right? Fucking put me down. I ended up in, a, in the West End Central uh, Police Station. Then that was it. I was straight double A cat and I looked like a canary for the next 10 years. After 19 years inside as a high risk double cat A inmate, Vic Dark was eventually released and met at the prison gates by his brother. And I remember sitting there, and I was in the reception, and uh, I went, and I didn't want to ask the screws, because I kept going, you know, I'm thinking to myself, he's going to be here, he's going to be here, and all of a sudden I heard the screw walk and go, fucking hell, you see that big Bentley turn up outside? And Bentley was there, and I knew it was my brother's, and I thought, yes. <laughs> so I walked outside, got a big bottle of champagne, give it all that, yeah, you know what I mean, one of those ones. You see them all looking out the window going, you flash cunt, you know what I mean? But what a nice, what a nice way to come out, you know? And uh, talk about rubbing it in, the, in, the old, in their faces, you know. But I remember the screw walking and going, fucking great big Bentley out there, convertible, I ain't never seen nothing like it. And it was my brother, wasn't it? I thought, well, yeah, I've arrived, you know. The upsurge in armed robberies was not just in the capital. Villains from across Britain were prepared to travel the length and breadth of the country to hit the most lucrative targets. In 1991, Glaswegians Mick Healy and Ian MacDonald conspired to rob the NatWest Bank in Torquay. I put a, a six-man gang together who I believed would have the whole to, to make this successful. And while I was there, uh, I was actually a cleaner, took a job as a cleaner. 
in the bank? Sober's in the bank, yeah. OK, so um, what, what did you do then? Now, what I did is uh, I was monitoring the bank for about two months or something until I got the, the feel of what was going down, the deliveries to the bank, and uh, it was Brink's mat. And on a Thursday, they would come there, three in the street, and take in 18 banks. So while I was in the bank, I'd realised there was a bank vault and a bank vault on top, and I'd realised it was actually a storage bank. So I knew we were talking millions of pounds. And when I was a cleaner in the bank, I used to go up on top of it, and it was all bonds worth millions of pounds, but they'd all been cash, so I knew this is really, really big. OK, so you got your team together, and uh, yeah. who did that include? Uh, my brother, Jim Healy. Uh, Blink McDonald, Mickey Carroll, uh, Rob Harper, and uh, Thomas Garrigan. Blink McDonald was involved in crime from an early age and was a member of the Standing Life Gang with Paul Ferris. He got his nickname because his enemies said that he would shoot you in the blink of an eye. The time I'd reached 30, I'd, I'd had a pub up in Springburn. Uh, with the, the missus at the time. And uh, Mick Keeley was on the run for the neck and he came up to the pub and he, he offered us, did a work to be in the team that was going to carry out a robbery in Torquay. It was, mix, it was six million pound. And it didn't take me long to say yes. And uh, Mick went away, then he came back. Then we all, we all travelled down to Torquay. And, uh, my missus at the time came down with my, my son and we were all staying in a caravan park and painting. We were there for two weeks just posing as tourists while we were trying to iron up this bank. Well, what we did is we, we put ourselves in a three mile radius of the actual bank and uh, went about getting the getaway cars, uh, firearms, bags for the cash, handcuffs to get certain people cuffed up and tie us to, to, to tie them up in the bank. Because we knew it was going to take us about at least 30, 30 minutes to hold in the bank. Can you, can you describe from sort of when they went into the bank? What, what the, the, the bank the bank was thing we broken into during the night. So it was, because at that time in June 1991, there was no alarms or anything like that. And uh, it was broken into during the night. And there was a hidey hole constructed at a back staircase where the vault was. And uh, and the staff came in in the morning, they opened up, they opened up the vault, and everybody jumped out, rounded up the bank staff. We'd actually taken the bank manager into the bank, brought him back out again. He said he didn't have the key for the bank vault. But we'd actually got into the vault, but there was a there was a security part that we didn't nobody knew anything about. And uh, that had actually stopped us from getting to the cash and the security the security uh what do you call them? The little silver boxes, deposit boxes. All them were on the left and the cash was on the right in the cages. And uh, we were so close to it. And when we came out, I took an independent person out and asked that person to identify the person who's actually got the key of this. And that person had turned around and said, that person there, which was the person I had already in the bank vault in the beginning, which is the bank manager. So a female identified him as having the key. At that, I thought he might probably thinks we're having a joke, so I discharged the firearm. I basically told the person it's not a fucking joke. Unable to get into the vault, the gang fled. Blink was arrested in the caravan park, but managed to escape and went on the run back up to Glasgow. After five weeks, I came to the same restaurant where we were sitting just now, and uh, my missus had came. And I, I came in half an hour after it. And uh, she says to us, have you been followed? I went, don't be silly, you know what I mean? But 10 minutes later, a guy and a woman walked into this same restaurant and sat at the table next to us. And I says to her right away, I went, undercover cops. And she went, don't be silly, they're a lovely couple. So three hours later, the lovely couple were the first people chumps at this table here, right in, right in top of us. And all the other diners, there was five guys posing as just celebrating all oh, the thing with past his, his driving test, blah, 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 Lo load of crap. They were cops and they were all armed. And uh, about 10, 12 cops came in in the front door and I was lifted up 
in their shirt, he's got a gun and he's pulled the gun out. And uh, I was going blue, and the wee, the wee Chinese guy ran out and he must have seen that I thought I was dying. And he's, he, I thought he was going to say, look, you're going to kill the guy. And he shouted, so he's paying the bill. <laughs> and at that, they, they'd let go of my, my, my neck and I, I've just put all the contents in my three course dinner and all my drink, or three of the Scottish Crime Squad. So it was one of the momentous moments in my criminal career and one of the saddest. Me putting the sick of the coppers then getting carted away at the neck. And uh, I got two and a half years for the gun for being in a Chinese restaurant. And we ended up going to trial at Bristol, that collapsed, and we went to the Bailey. And I got 16 years, so I was doing 18 and a half years. And uh, how old were you then? 30. You know, you put on a brave face, but when that cell door shuts at night and you're 27, yeah. and you're lying there looking at the ceiling, how yeah. does 31 years feel like? Uh, hardcore, because I haven't lived that long. I was only 27. And when I went to the prison system in England, I found out, obviously, that I was in some ways either badder or indifferent, because I found myself looking around, looking for other people doing fixed sentences between 30 years and over, and there was only 14 out of 87,000 men. So that was, that was quite difficult. Nobody killed, nobody shot. Well, I was just thinking there, the crowd's got 30 years, not Yes, and I got <laughs> and 31. Got 31. And I got 31. And nobody died. Nobody died, nobody got shot, nobody, nobody got, got stabbed. Injured. Nobody got injured. It was just the fact that it was money and the fact that it was um, some Glasgow politics were pulled into the trial also. But when we got, when we got sentenced, I always remember coming out of the Old Bailey, I was handcuffed to Mac. And uh, he just got 19 years, I did only 12 years, and he was doing 31 years. And I was still trying to cope with my 16 and the two and a half years I'd got. And uh, I always remember saying to Mike, Christ, you're doing longer than the train robbers. He was doing 31 years. And uh, me and Mick were walking around Belmarsh the next day, I always remember, even though it was 20 years ago. We were walking around Belmarsh, we were in the high security unit in there. And uh, me and Mick were walking around the yard and saying, when is this black tunnel going to end? <laughs> and I can laugh now about it, but at the time it wasn't a laughing matter. But we played for high stakes and we lost, so I did. Like Blink McDonald, Angelo Heyman was an armed robber who'd enjoyed a lucrative career, knocking over post offices and banks in London. But in 1995, he did the big one when he and his gang members hijacked a security van in the heart of the city, right in front of Snow Hill Police Station. The van was carrying close to six million. The day of the robbery, got up at six o'clock in the morning, went down to the city of London, picked up the stolen vehicles we was going to use first of all, went down to the city of London. The old plan was I was going to park up, when the van came, I was going to drive in front of the van, stop the van, and the other two people who were with me get on, the van, get on the van and all. I was going to hijack the van. So what happened was, well, the funny, funny thing first of all was, I'm, I'm by the old Bailey, and it's like a great big grand car park there. I was parked there waiting for my time for the van to come. Then all of a sudden, this police, big black police car come, stuck beside me, and they was all inside the open looking at my car. I was in, and I think, oh shit, I'm in trouble now, ain't I? So I was scared, and I'm thinking, it may have probably three or four seconds, I had 20 thoughts going through my head. Is this right to do? Should I do it? Should I not do it? Am I going to get caught? Am I going to get away? They all come from me in seconds, seconds, but I decided you started the job, so you've got to finish it. You can't go there, start it, and then walk away after. So the matter how scared I was, which I was scared, I carried on doing it and done the job. Ten minutes later, I drove around the front, stopped the van, got out, told the guy he's going to blow his head, his head off. Uh, he opened up the van, the other two people got inside the van, and then they followed me to where the lock-up was. We went inside the lock-up, parked up the van, cut the roof off the top of it, got the stuff out we wanted, then drove off again. Tried to drive up, of course, obviously, you know what I mean? Then we drove off again to come out, out to the city of London. 
and drive it off out the city of London, you had the armed police, because it was a self, that's square, safe square mile. So you had the armed police stopping you, because the IRA, the IRA, I think it was. So what they done, when we got to the checkpoints, the armed police were there, there's three of us all got guns inside the van. And we stopped and thought, well, we could be in a bit of trouble, we were able to search the van, but they didn't. We went, we went, what could we get through, mate, with a bit of a rush? They went, yeah, come, fellas, come through, and flush us through. So we just drove through the old bill, went to another place to lock up, where we already done, got piss bottles and all that, so you can wean the bottle, we'll take the bottle with you so you don't leave the DNA. Opened up the parcels, there was bonds, there was diamonds, loads of diamonds. There's money in tins. But you'd be surprised what they put through the, po the post. Angelo and the gang got away with the robbery, but a few months later they had a meeting with another East End villain called Danny Woolard. Unknown to themselves at the time, Danny's office was being bugged by the police over a separate murder investigation. Well, what actually happened, there was a, a debt being picked up <coughs> and uh, I had a fella living in my offices in Yard, because we had four or five places. And uh, he got a bit out of hand and he killed this guy. But he, he got rid of the body or we done what he had to do, you see. And uh, he was all forgotten with. He was all forgotten with, everything disposed of, the cars they was using, everything. But this fella went round nightclubs after about six months bragging about it. On cocaine, you know the scene, bragging about what he'd done to this, he stuck my name up as well. Well, when this robbery happened, we had all the, the bonds and that in my offices, and they had the place bugged up trying to catch him, but he's killing. He said they caught everybody else in his bit of work, and they nicked me for the murder. But um, as I said, I went to court a few times, but uh, I never said nothing, and um, I got out of that, but they still lumped me up for what they'd done and put me on randomly in charge with his bonds. I got eight in the four. Like, it was unheard of, really. Despite the sentence, both Heyman and Woolard remain unrepentant about who they are and what they've done. Prison never reformed me at all. All it done was make me meet new people and carry on the way I was. So the whole point is, when you come out of prison, you haven't got no money. So you've got to go and get some, haven't you? Well, we ain't, we ain't in politicians or nothing, we ain't a doctor. We've got to do what we know. If you can't do the time, don't do the crime. It's all part of the life, ain't it? If you want to be a crook, you've got to, it's not all good all the time, you've got to accept the good and the bad. And the bad is getting caught and going to prison. And the good is spending money, enjoying yourself, getting respect from people. So, you know, if you can't do it, don't do it. Another man who knows all about prison time is Freddie Foreman, one of London's true criminal masterminds. At 10.30 in the morning on Easter Monday, 1983, six masked men broke into the Security Express Depot in Curtin Road in Shoreditch, East London. They tied up and blindfolded the guards and doused one in petrol to get him to reveal the combination to the main safe. After a raid that lasted about five hours, the gang escaped with nearly six million pounds. Britain and its newspapers were stunned. Slowly but surely, the gang, including Ronnie Knight, were tracked down and arrested. Brown Bread Fred, as he was known, was charged for his role in the robbery, but to this day professes his innocence. I was uh, charged with the, with, the, with the robbery, but there was, there, was, there was no evidence whatsoever, and I was charged with handling money from the robbery, which could have been money from another robbery. It, it was stated in the charge sheet, cash from the Secure Express robbery, right? But there was no evidence that that cash, what they found in my bank account, some of it was distributed in the Irish, Allied Irish Bank. They found 360 grand that had been gone through the bank. But uh, other, they never found that, nothing else. That was all the evidence that it was. 
Foreman was living in what he'd hoped was the relative safety of Spain when he was suddenly arrested by Spanish police and smuggled back to Britain. They just snatched me off the street. And then when they got me to the police, uh, on they, 100 mile an hour, they were going 90 mile an hour down the motorway. I tried to crash the car and uh, everything, you know, with the driver, and I was handcuffed, so I couldn't do much. And then when I got to the airport, I, I broke away from the, when they got me out of the plane, drove me straight on the tarmac underneath the plane. The plane's waiting to take off. And they, they, they haven't got a passenger on the plane, just a plain empty plane. And when I got out and I went over the barrier into the back into the airport, they chased me, caught me, brought me back again, carried me up the stairs, I kicked them, got my foot on the stairs, we all went down the stairs from the top to the bottom and landed on the on the, the, the tarmac again. Then they got very angry with me, the, the Spanish police, because they got injured and they was punching me in the privates and one thing and another. Airlines, eh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then when they got me face down on the plane, on the floor, they, uh, one very considerate uh, steward, male steward, come up to me and said, yeah, hey, Mr. Foreman, have a drink of this. And he'd give me a beaker of drink. I thought it was in, it was in August, so it was sweltering hot. And I thought he was giving me a drink of water and I drank it down. And then I tasted the bitterness in it and I realised the bastard had uh, doped me, he'd drugged me, he'd give me the knockout drug, and not he? And I don't remember much after that. I know they carried me down and the two Spanish coppers were sitting next to me all the way back to England, and I was still handcuffed with my hands behind my back. And that, and that caused me, I had to have an operation on my wrist, as you see the scar there afterwards. Uh, the, uh, his hands were turning black, you know, with the... Uh, been laying on them all the, all the time. Uh, and uh, they woke me up, they had to wake me up at Heathrow and shake me and get me, a, wake me up. And th then I saw this uh, Fred Cutts coming towards me. He's an ex yard copper. Uh, he's an ex uh, now, he's retired now, but he was walking towards me with a, a string of other coppers. And uh, they, they took me off the plane in my shorts and my t shirt. And there was a bank of photographers all around the airport, all taking photos of me. And and on the on the, uh, the news that my my grandchildren was back over in Spain, they were saying there's Papa Fred there on on the news, on the Spanish news, you know. In the end, Foreman was found not guilty of the actual Security Express robbery, but guilty of handling the money from the robbery and sentenced to nine years in jail. The millions of pounds from the Security Express job and the Brinks Mat robbery later that year were used by the crime bosses to buy drugs, including ecstasy. They flooded the city's club and rave scenes, places like Raquel's in Bazardon, where I ran the doors. When I first started working here, people used to uh, put up with the violence, you know, like the local heroes. And uh, I didn't think that was working, so I suggested that we dealt with them. And um, most of the people who initially caused trouble in here ended up exiting. Um, that's where the dance floor was on the second floor. And so we used to put them out through the fire exit and down onto the staircase and they'd exit the club via the concrete staircase, usually head first through these doors out into the street. Raquel's had a reputation for violence that was known throughout the southeast. Queues for ambulances often outstretched the nearby taxi rank. The club was extremely violent, but it wasn't unusual for people to be knifed. Um, a guy from Leeds come to the door one night and he was refused entry and he pulled out a fisherman's knife. I don't know what a guy from Leeds is doing with a fisherman's knife. But he had a fisherman's knife and he started waving it about. So I pulled out, I used to have a big combat knife, I used to keep it in the back of my trousers. So I pulled out the combat knife and chased him. And the man manager was running after me screaming, saying, Bernie, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And we caught him outside the bingo all across the road, the gala bingo. <laughs> it's not funny, but you know, it happened. And uh, he was stabbed two or three times in the thighs and he was cut a, 
sort of from the left side of his mouth to his right ear and left on the pavement. And people say, I, you know, I'm older and wiser now and it's wrong, but if you don't take, you know, if there's a guy waving a knife at you and you don't do anything, or the chances are he's going to stab you. Um, so they used to choose the way it went. They pick up a bat, we'll pick up a bat. If they pick up a knife, we'll pick up a knife. They came with guns, you know, and we had guns in the club in the ceiling, in the reception area. Raquel's was at the heart of the Essex rave scene, which attracted dealers and the love drug, ecstasy. There was just a constant supply because rather than just have um, groups of, of drug dealers, um, my partner then, Tony Tucker, came up with this idea where um, drug dealers would come to him. He would give them the exclusive rights to sell in the club for a fee, of course. He would supply them with their stock. So he knew there was no shit being sold in there. And uh, it worked very well. In November 1995, 18-year-old Leah Betts took an ecstasy pill, which had been bought by her friends at Rackhill's. She died a few days later. I knew it was going to cause us trouble. So I rung everybody up, and everybody had gone to ground, couldn't get hold of anyone. And uh, it was all over the news. This girl had took ecstasy in the club, which was false. She didn't take it in the club. That's what they were reporting at the time. And um, the next thing, the police descended on me and said, look, the girl's alive, but we need one of these pills so the medical people can analyze it and maybe try and help her. And I didn't even think about it. I said, I'll, I'll get you one. But my partners took her, Tate and Rolf, well, more so took her. Had the ump over it, because you're fucking helping the police, you're a wrong and you're, oh no, shut up. It's a fucking 18 year old girl, do you know what I mean? So we fell out, fell out over that. Um, and then the threat started, started threatening me. We're going to do this. I said, you know where I fucking live? What, what are you ringing me up for? You say you're going to do it, just do it. Stop ringing me up and pestering me. And um, I was pulled in by the police on the 6th of December. And they said to me, look, it's, it's called an Osman warning where they tell you that someone's going to kill you or there's been a threat to kill you. And he said, these people, you know, we've heard they're going to do you and obviously you know what they're like. There's a good chance that they'll carry it out. And I said, it's all fucking talk. In the end, Tucker, Rolf and Tate were found shot dead in their Range Rover, parked up a country lane near the village of Rettenden. Around six o'clock, they all left home and um, got into this Range Rover. And uh, they headed to a pub called the Halfway House where they were going to meet the man who was going to show them the landing strip. At the Halfway House, the guy got in the back of the car with Tate. He was um, in the rear seat behind the passenger seat. Tucker was sitting where I'm sitting in the front passenger seat. Rolf was driving and the uh, co-conspirator was sitting behind the driver. So they drove from, along the A127 to um, a village called Rettenden and turned down a, a deserted farm track. It's quite a long track and uh, it's, it's quite difficult to get down there. Got potholes and stuff. And um, when they reached the bottom of the, the track, there was a, a double bar gate, a six bar gate, sorry, which was locked. And the guy behind the driver said, um, I'll get the gate. And obviously it was about seven o'clock then, pitch black. So he's opened his back door to get out. And when he's opened the door, the interior lights come on. And um, he's walked to the front of the car, pretending to open the gate. They've sat them three sat in the car, not expecting anything. And there's been a gunman laying in wait in a boiler suit. He's come out of the hedge and um, come up to the open door at the rear of the Range Rover and shot 
Rolf who was driving behind the ear. That's put the driver out of it. When they found Rolf, his hands were still on the steering wheel and his foot was still on the brake. He hadn't even moved. He then turned the gun on Tucker and shot him in the cheek, just there. And uh, that blew his jaw, his teeth, and all that around the left hand side of his face. And he just slumped forward with his mobile phone in his hand. Then he turned the gun on Pat Tate, who was in the back. And he shot him in the liver, shot him in the side, because Tate was a catalyst for the murders. And it was him they wanted to speak to. So then he shot Rolf again in the back of the head. He shot Tucker again in the face. And uh, he then turned to Tate and spoke to Tate about his bad behaviour. And Tate, I'm told, was squealing like a baby, begging him not to shoot him. So obviously the gunman didn't listen and shot Tate in the head. In 1998, two men, Jack Wones and Michael Steele, were jailed for the triple murder. Their convictions were based on the confession of a police informant called Darren Nichols, who claimed that he had driven the pair to the country lane that night and picked them up after the shooting. But many people were concerned about his testimony, given the lack of evidence to back it up. John Wones has long campaigned over his brother's innocence and believes that Tucker, Rolf and Tate were executed by the authorities. On that night, they was definitely lured down there. They was lured down there. I mean, it wasn't a tea party they was going to. They was going to some sort of deal. And someone laid in wait for them because they went unarmed, burned, didn't they? You know Tate, Tucker and Rolf, and they never went with their guns. They went everywhere with their guns, didn't they? And that's what I've learned, you know? Why did they not go down there with their guns? Who was they meeting? They must have met. They must have been meeting someone that didn't know that they was armed. Old Bill, police. But you think the police killed? Yeah, 100%. There was there, there was there was no guns, no drugs, no DNA, no time of death, nothing down that lane. Those three those three men, Bernie, was under 24 hour surveillance, right? 24 hour surveillance for three months prior to their deaths. Their deaths. They died on the 6th of December, 1995. Yeah, their surveillance finished on the 5th of December. Their surveillance never finished. They were seen. The executors were seen at that scene. But the police can't say we see it because they would be at the scene. To be a villain, I thought, was to be a somebody. But reality hit home when my associates were shot. They believed that they were above the law and really thought they were untouchable. But as gangs throughout history have learned, it's only a matter of time before others tire of your activities. Your rivals either pick up a phone to report you to the police or they pick up a gun to kill you. A prison cell or a grave the career options for those involved in gangs. <laughs>